Thank you for listening to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast with host Clara and Jimmy Hinton. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe and share so you never miss an episode. Search for us on your favorite podcast app, or you can find the podcast on jimmyhinton.org and findingahealingplace.com. Please rate our show, subscribe, and share so we can spread the word. If you would like to support us and get exclusive rewards, go to patreon.com slash speaking out. Find the tier that best fits you and join as a patron of the podcast. Now let's get into the show. Welcome to this week's podcast with host Jimmy Hinton. And Jimmy's mom, Clara. And very special guest, Nagme Pahini. Nagme, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit and and just give some of your background. Uh, A lot of people knew you uh, back in 2012 when your uh, then husband, Saeed, was uh, he was arrested in Iran. And this sparked a big national um, outcry. And then eventually the Obama administration uh, intervened and they were able to get him released from prison in Iran. But I'll let you tell a little bit of uh, the story and... um, And then we'll jump in and ask you some questions. Yeah, I kind of entered the world stage in 2012 when uh, Saeed was arrested in Iran and put in prison for his Christian faith. I uh, he was put under house arrest in July of 2012 and then put in uh, actual prison uh, in September of 2012. I didn't. I decided to wait. hopefully that Iran would release him without any noise. I didn't really go to media till this around December, I think of 2012. And my first interview with, was with Hannity at Fox news. And it just kind of blew up from there. Yeah. Um, I was on Fox many times and then CNN picked it up and basically all the media is from NPR to Reuters to, uh, you know, us, uh, all, all the news stations, whether conservative or liberal, started picking it up and it became pretty big. It reached, um, I know by 2014, it had reached over 500 million people. Wow. Probably by 2016, it probably reached <clears throat> close to a billion. Uh, most people knew either Saeed by name, Pastor Saeed or Saeed Abedini or me, Nagme, Nagme Abedini, or they knew about the pastor that was in prison in Iran. And the reason for that was, his imprisonment kind of coincided with the um, making a nuclear agreement with Iran. And so a lot of people use that as how are we making a deal with Iran when there's a pastor in pri- American pastor in prison in Iran. So it became very big. All the news was on, on it. And I was on media uh, speaking out against Iran's persecution of religious minorities, including Christians. Um, Many times I was on the uh, news, probably three, four, or five times a week. I remember seeing it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was so much in the news that you couldn't get away from it. So I remember you, you know, from back right. in 2012, because I, I was yes. shortly after uh, when when we we reported my dad. That right. was 2011. So that was one year later, and mm-hmm. I just remember because this was all fresh with us. Exactly. And I was like, wow, <clears throat> you know, and, and it really. Uh, it just really made a big impact on me. And, and, you know, of course your courage and uh, the ability to speak up uh, being everywhere on TV, it just caught my attention immediately. Um, and that, you know, I think probably most of the listeners after hearing you talk will, will remember that because I mean, it was everywhere. So yeah, I think to this day, wherever I go, people recognize my face and they're like, I know you from yeah. somewhere. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. They can't figure out how they know me. And I'm like, from the news. And like, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. I was advocating. So yes. yeah. Still to this day, wherever I go, they recognize me. So. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, we want to thank you again for coming on. Yes. And, you know, obviously we talk about a lot about sexual abuse in the church. Uh, your story is a little bit different. And one of the things that I noticed right away was the number of survivors in the domestic abuse um, community started reaching out to us. Yeah. Um, I mean, en masse. And they were yes. just like, oh my goodness, like we listened to your we listened to your podcast on sexual abuse and the similarities and the overlap for how abusers think and operate is mm-hmm. is absolutely frightening. And you know, I think abusers just all think in the same way. And and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but you know, what's interesting to me is that 
like I was telling you a little bit before we recorded, I, I was looking up your name just, you know, just for the heck of it, because I kind of figured what would come up. And of course, when you were in front of the cameras and Saeed was in prison, you guys were like this, this power couple, these um, Iranian American uh, Christian people. He was locked up in, in Iran. It was this big humanitarian uh, crisis that was going on. You guys were like the model Christian family. And I could find tons of stuff on the media when that was happening. And then these leaked emails came out between you and some friends. There was like one or two articles on that where you disclosed that you were being abused when he was in prison, which you quickly, at, at least it's your story, but it seems like you retracted that pretty quickly. Um, and I kind of have uh, some theories for why, because, you know, as a Christian couple, it's not okay to talk about abuse. So people do try to silence you. Um, and then crickets. After you started coming out, um, he was released from prison. Uh, you guys separated, eventually divorced. Uh, you started advocating for domestic violence, absolute crickets, right? With all mm -hmm. these Christian media outlets that, that covered your story. So I want you to talk a little bit about that because I find that just, um, it, it's disheartening a little bit. Well, uh, I didn't even know I was under abuse. Like you said, it seems like they all go along with the same playbook and I groom you to cover up for their bad behavior and any speaking out is, uh, you feel shame. I was, I was ashamed to even tell my mom if there was any conflict in our marriage um, because I felt like I was destroying his reputation with my mom. It, was, it would never get restored if, I, if my parents knew about what was happening and I had to just keep his relationship with others well. And so I didn't even know I was under that. It was a fog. I knew there was something wrong in my marriage. There was physical abuse. It wasn't very much. It happened a couple of times. Uh, one where I was pregnant with my daughter and I literally thought I was going to die. I was beat up so bad, but I excused that, you know, he was under stress. I talked back. I shouldn't have been so sassy. Um, and then there was emotional, psychological, which I didn't even know existed. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, you know, sexual abuse, he was uh, addicted to porn. I didn't even realize that you could be sexually abused in your marriage. But now looking back, it was, you know, I was, I was very naive. I'd never been with anyone. And he was, Said was, you know, I was caught up in the purity movement. He was my first relationship. So I didn't even know the, what, what sexual abuse was. But uh, I didn't, so I didn't know when I was advocating for him, I knew that we are not supposed to air our dirty laundry. And if, if anything negative came out about Saeed, then people wouldn't advocate for him. I needed to get him out of prison. So it was really not appropriate for me to say, yeah, we've had marriage issues. I, would, I couldn't even put the name abuse on it. I didn't know what mm -hmm. it was um, until things just kept, he got access to a smartphone inside of the prison and he was... I realized, man, this guy has not changed. It's actually, he developed severe PTSD and paranoia and he thought I was his enemy and I was trying to steal his fame. And it got actually much worse where I felt threatened uh, by him. But, but no one, I was told no one can know he has a secret phone inside of the prison. He could be uh, used against him by the Iranian government. He can get higher sentences. He could get in trouble. He could, you know, so I had to keep that a secret, which... Later on, I was labeled as a liar for that. So here mm -hmm. I was being, I was advocating for Saeed towards the last year of his imprisonment. I was being attacked horribly by him. And I, I would tell him every time you attack me, he would call me a whore, a Jezebel wanting to be, you know, he would say, I, he hated that I was traveling because he realized I was gaining some self-esteem confidence. But then at the mm -hmm. same time, I would say, well, I don't need to travel if it's bothering you. And he would say, no, 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 you need to keep the story alive. So no matter what I did, I was in trouble. Yeah, mm -hmm. I couldn't understand what was going on until I went to a trip in North Carolina and I confessed to a pastor. I said, I don't understand this. This is how my marriage has been. He's still attacking me from prison. I have laid down my life for this man. I don't get it. And the pastor told me he, he was a psychologist and he said, you're an abused wife. And that's when I got the diagnosis and I didn't even know what, what an abused wife is. I went home and I, uh, to the, my hotel, I Googled it and he, he had all the signs. I didn't even know isolation, yeah. protection, deflection, 
the silent treatment, just all of it, how you peop, uh, abusers use all these toolboxes to control and manipulate. I just, I didn't know what gaslighting was. I, the more I read, I said, how do these people know my story? You know, and uh, mm -hmm. I was very distraught. I didn't sleep that night. I got on the plane to come back home. And on my way home, I released an email to about a hundred people that were very close to me. I don't remember the number, but it was over a hundred. It wasn't like thousands or, you know, a few hundred. I don't remember the exact number because I deleted that. I was so afraid that it had leaked that I was, I deleted everything. But I basically, I was in the um, middle of a crisis and I wrote, I have been abused and I'm an abused wife, but I love Saeed and I'm writing to you guys because these people were his biggest supporters. They were the ones doing prayer vigils and all that. And I said, I know you guys will pray for us. I want our marriage to survive. I just want you to pray for Saeed. And well, it got leaked to media. So I didn't yep. make it public. I was told I made it public. I didn't. Mm -hmm. It became, but I'm glad it did, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, the head of Saeed's denomination called me soon after it came out. He said, not many millions could have been deceived. So God and his goodness allowed this to come to light. But I was yeah. shamed and I was silenced by the first phone call I got was from a very, very well-known name. And he said, can I ask you something? Are you cheating on Saeed? And that was the first <laughs> accusation. And from there it was, she's cheating on him. She's trying mm -hmm. to put him, throw him under the bus. Uh, to this day, I've been divorced for four years. I have not dated. Like I have, the accusation was so above and beyond false that it was ridiculous. And um, and then there was, you know, she's doing it for fame and money and all of that. It was so overwhelming. And anytime I said anything, there was so much attack and shaming, to, shaming me into silence that I did go silent for a season. But not, not a lot of media covered it. Not a lot of media really covered um, my claim of abuse, even though mm -hmm. you could see over time Saeed's bad behavior over social media. He was being arrested here locally. He has a warrant out for his arrest currently in Idaho. Uh, none of this is out there. People don't know he has a criminal record here and he cannot enter Idaho without being arrested. But I, I went silent for a season. And the only reason I came out and actually started an organization about um, domestic abuse was actually, it's a long story, but it was to help persecuted women. I, we started the organization to help persecuted Iran, uh, Christian women that were being persecuted in Iran. And eventually I realized other women were reaching out. It was just, it, it, it eventually after three years, I started speaking about domestic abuse, but there was years where I just was silent because of the shaming, because of the attacks and because media wasn't really interested in my side of the story. I remember Christianity Today interviewed Saeed and it was his side of the story. Uh, Fox News interviewed Saeed, it was his side of the story. I was, you know, the first, uh, the first uh, things released by leaders was shaming me into silence. There's two sides to the story. And so uh, there was crickets with uh, people. I, I was no longer a story worth, worth touching yeah. <laughs> because it was not the happy ending. It was not the hero wife, the perfect family. And, and it was not the way people wanted God to write the story. And I didn't, I wanted our family to heal as well, but this is how it worked out. And I remember crying out to God at that time, why God, why didn't you restore my marriage? I thought I'm going to fight for Saeed and you're going to show him how much I love him and how much of a good wife I am and you're going to restore it. And I just know he didn't allow it for me to understand abuse and for this to come to light at a world stage. Yeah. Um, and so it's just, it's sad that there was still people are not happy that we're not married. And I I think this is one of the saddest things about, about abuse. And I, you know, I, I learned this early on in, you know, just speaking out. Cause I, I started blogging, you started blogging right. pretty, pretty immediately. Right. Um, you know, we kind of came out of the gate saying, look, you know, my dad, former pastor, I preach at the church where he preached, you know, I, I grew up in that church. And um, as soon as, as soon as my sister disclosed it to me, um, her and I were in the police station reporting it. It wasn't even a question. And I started hearing back from people right away. And, and it was like this sympathy towards my dad. And it was, wow. you know, it was like, oh, how's, how's your dad doing? You know, that's, that's just so terrible that, 
that he backslid and fell into temptation and like, you know, all this minimizing of abuse. And I was like, after a while, I just stopped and I was like, he's actually doing fine. You know, he's in jail. He brags about how he has the guards wrapped around his finger. Um, I visit him. They, they practically roll the red carpet out when I go visit him. It's like this bizarre world that like he just he's loved. And I said, it's his victims who aren't doing well. And people got the hint a after a while, but it's a yeah. lifetime of dealing with what happened to you and yeah. lifetime of, of that victims have to deal with. They, you know, it's so mind boggling that people care more about their hero or their idol than mm -hmm. the victim. And God is about saving lives. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. if a Sabbath structure is broken for the sake of a life being uh, restored, Jesus broke it, broke the rule he God had set up himself in the 10th command, commandment, God, you know, set up marriage, but if it's for the sake of rescuing the person's health and well being is more important to God than an institute. But we, yeah. but people hold an institute of church or the pastor or marriage, or they hold it so much higher than the well being of the flock and the women and children that are being abused. And yeah. it's really sad. That's not the heart of God. Jesus stood up to that jesus spoke out against that and um it's really sad i've i've been shamed many victims are shamed and into silence and people are more worried about you know someone a mess i came out recently about ben corson and uh, his sexual abuse of the woman in the church and someone said poor ben what if he sees this and he commits suicide because of what you're saying mm -hmm. i'm not right. responsible for someone's right. action it's like an yeah. abuser saying Oh no, this has come out and I'm going to kill myself. Well, I am not responsible for your sin. Like you yeah. have two options. You can repent, mm -hmm. you can, you know, humble yourself or do whatever, but I'm not responsible for the action. And for so yeah. long, yeah. I lived under that fear of, of truth coming to light and the con like worried for my abuser. And it's, it's just, it's a sad mentality because there's so many victims and they continue when there's silence, they continue in their bad behavior. It's, yeah. it's what they want. You know, it's exactly what they want. It, it, it's this bizarre thing. You know, I, I found that out too. Like I was this oddball, like, oh my goodness, people started reaching out to me, survivors everywhere. They're like, oh my goodness, there's, there's actually a pastor who reported, reported an abuser and it was your dad. And they were like intrigued with this. And I was like, is this, is it this uncommon that somebody would do the right thing and protect the innocent. Like he was raping children. Of course, I'm going to report him. Um, yeah. And I think it's God is testing our loyalty to him versus to people. Are you more loyal to a mm -hmm. pastor than to God and doing the right thing? Are you more loyal to your yeah. husband than God and doing the right thing? Are you more loyal? I had uh, soon after my stuff with Saeed came out, I, I was put in a situation where Either I could stand with my pastor and defend him, which later I found out he was abusive and had committed adultery or do the right thing. And I, you know, God, every time I've been tested with loyalty, do you, am I putting God first over, over feeling loyal to my husband or my pastor and doing the right thing to protect the innocent? And that's, I, I believe it's God is addressing idolatry in our life. Is God first or do you have other idols that you're clinging to? willing to disregard the word of God, to speak out for the oppressed, for the abused? Uh, are you willing to be, are you silent because there's an idol in your life and you're more worried about your idol being broken than um, people being abused? And I, I really think it's one of the things God's addressing through all of this is idolatry. I would love to get your that's opinion really, on this. Yeah, that, that's big. Yeah, that's, that's huge what you're saying. And I appreciate so much you saying you were kind of pushed into silence. Um, I know I went through a period of probably two years, Jimmy, of, of total silence. Mm -hmm. I got tired of trying to defend myself because of things that were being said about me from my husband when, when we separated. Um, he was the hero. He was the kind person. He was the sane person. I was cast in the light of being crazy, of being, um, uh, yeah, of being this nasty person, of having affairs, of uh, the whole thing. And I got flat out tired, exhausted of trying to defend myself. So I just kept quiet. I just 
went into silence and I prayed often for God to just shine the light on the truth. That's all without me having to say anything. And eventually the truth comes out, but man, a lot of people can really peck you to the point of where you feel like you, you can't take it anymore because they are just so at you in your face. How could you do this? How could you leave this kind man? How could you treat him so mean? He's Why? A martyr. He's a yeah. persecuted Christian. Right. Yes. So I totally 100% get what you're saying. It's, it's only yours is on a much larger scale. You had a platform of the whole world just about looking at you. I can't imagine what that was like. I truly can't. Um, But you summed it up by saying, is it going to be God first? Or is it going to be an idol? So and, and that's what it is. That's what it comes down to. So I appreciate you so very much, um, your strength and, and your allegiance to God. Your, your, um, and that's how we should be. Well, that's, I mean, that I, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think that's what makes you unique is yes. we see so many survivors and I understand it, that how their view of God gets really twisted because of the abuse. And a lot of abusers do the abuse in the name of God. Um, so I completely I'm sympathetic to that. I understand that. You know, we have lots of people who listen who used to be believers who are no right. longer believers. Um, but you really have you really have stuck with your faith um and yes. and are very vocal about your faith. Uh you still evangelize, you minister to people, you minister to women all over the place, um, in the name of God, you teach them about God. And, you know, I, I want to ask you a little bit about that, but I want your opinion on this because it's my feeling that people think Christians think they're doing the right thing in the name of God by supporting abusers. Um, because they, Mm -hmm. they have this distorted view of grace and grace is like the it's like this generic salve that just fixes everything. And, yeah. and if you, Nagme, can't accept God's grace for Saeed, then the problem's with you, not with Saeed. Um, and that's kind of how people, th- that almost becomes the idol for people. Mm-hmm. The grace, a mm-hmm. twisted view of grace becomes the idol, where instead of stepping in between the abuser and the abused, They'd rather see you live in danger and just say, well, if, if you're just more of a submissive wife, uh, you'll win him over mm-hmm. with your gentle and quiet spirit. Like, do you feel like you got a lot of that? <laughs> I would. That I had to reach a point where I was gentle. Once I would call me from prison, I wouldn't talk back. I was trying to be submissive and it didn't work. It blew up in my face. God's like, yeah. nope. Submitting to corruption and abuse is not God's way. And I expect that God, I'm doing my part. I'm submitting. I'm being quiet, submissive, kind. I am being a doormat. Okay, God, do your part and rescue me. And there was nothing Mm -hmm. until I obeyed God's word. And I said, no, I'm not going to submit to corruption. I'm not going to submit to abuse. There's a part we play in obeying to God's word. He's already told us what to do. A lot of times we want God to do something, but we 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 do not want to tear down our idols or obey ourselves. So there is a part we play, but yeah, it's, um, I was just, it, it doesn't, I had to reach to a point where no amount of, I realized no amount of submission was going to save my marriage. It was obedience to God. And if my marriage survived, it was in his hand. I didn't divorce. I was, t- I was so afraid of God hating divorce that I did not divorce. Mm-hmm. I filed for a legal separation for the protection of me and the kids. And by God's grace, I divorced me, but, uh, but it's, I, you know, it's just, but, but I it, calling out and separating and calling out someone to repentance, that's showing grace. God shows grace to the humble. We forget, mm-hmm. uh, we, we want to paint God as the way we think he is. He is, uh, yeah, he shows grace to the humble and repentance. That's not how he treats the unrepentant, prideful person. It's actually right. You don't see that in the Bible. It's he's very harsh to the prideful, arrogant, unrepentant person. And so people are confused where it's it's misapplication of grace. And yeah. if God doesn't show grace to the unrepentant, prideful person, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13, have nothing to do with this evil person who calls himself a Christian, right? Then why why are we associating with these people on, you know, you know, and 
at, if there is any opportunity for any of these abusers to come to repentance, which is rare, it's if the church calls them out, keeps them accountable and separates them from the flock that they've been hurting. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, that's the biblical way. And it's, I did Absolutely. not, um, I did not file for legal separation out of bitterness, anger, resentment. I did it out of complete love for my husband. I thought I, in the, I really believed, okay, God, I'm taking my hands off. I'm giving sight over to you and I'm drawing boundaries. You will save my marriage. I really thought he would save my marriage. If I did that, it was out of love that I drew boundaries mm -hmm. and called Saeed to repentance. Yeah. It was not out of bitterness, anger, or any of that at all. Well, it's interesting because Paul takes that further in 1 Corinthians 5, and he says, hand, shouldn't you hand this man over to Satan so that on the day of judgment, his soul would be saved, right? Like it's this letting Satan have his way with, with the unchangeable person who's unrepentant, who's defiant, uh, who is, who's bragging about what he does. This guy's high-fiving people with his sexual relationship with his mother, you know, and exactly. the Corinthian church, Paul says, shouldn't you be, shouldn't you mourn over this and hand this man over to Satan? So, uh, maybe, so that maybe he will be saved. Yeah. So that he'll be saved, you know, because by coddling him, by bringing him in, um, you're not doing him a favor and you're not no, doing each not other. A favor. No, it's, it's not. not loving towards the abuser at all. That's right. That's not an act of grace right. oh. to, to turn a blind eye to abuse. And to let the the abuser think that it's okay to keep doing it that's not an act of grace it's not love or grace showing grace to the abuser and it's definitely not protecting the flock and those who need to be protected so right. it's just not biblical at all yeah back up for just one minute just a brief minute you said that until that pastor said to you this is abuse it didn't click with you that you were being abused I, do you think that's so with a lot of w women, especially that they remain in these almost paralyzed in these horrific marriages because they don't even realize no. that that that's what's going on, especially yeah. with psychological and mental abuse, physical abuse. Um, you can see the bruises and the cuts and the broken bones. But even then women will often choose. Like I did. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to see when it's not physical and even when it is physical, you justify it, right? You know, you can justify it, but yeah, it's, uh, I would say to women or someone who doesn't know if they're being abused or not, you know, something's wrong. You're, you are wasting away. Right. Um, you know, I was wasting away in that marriage mm -hmm. and it's interesting. People wanted to save the marriage and possibly endanger me and my children's life. Here I am outside of that marriage. I'm thriving. I've experienced yeah. joy and peace like never before. My kids are thriving in their relationship with God. We are, God has used us to evangelize to Muslims. Mo Muslim mm -hmm. women are coming to know Christ because of God's testimony in my life of mm -hmm. out of abuse but people are not happy about that because the marriage was not saved, but mm -hmm. I was saved. My children were saved, but that doesn't, you know, that a thousand were being saved. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. not yeah. a happy ending. Mixed to up. People. Right. And, but it's God's happy ending to me. Yes. He rescued me, yes. you know, and you say why I didn't walk away from God. I had nowhere else to go. You know, it's like mm -hmm. Peter saying, where else do I have to go? I, it, he said, he did use a lot of scripture being a pastor to manipulate me. And it was hard for me to read certain parts of scripture, but I had nowhere else to go, but prayer and scripture and seeking God. And when I realized that's not the heart of God that I would submit or be harmed in any way, my love for God grew because I, I gained a new understanding of God's love and God's great and understanding God's desire for protection over me. Jesus is not worried about a marriage dissolving. He's more yeah. worried about the woman right. or children or uh, anyone wasting away under abuse. That's the heart of God. That's yes. the heart of God is protecting, saving life, you know? And so when I realized that's the heart of God, my relationship with God even became stronger because God was being portrayed in a twisted way in my marriage. Mm, exactly. And, and that yes. was not right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I, I think, I mean, <clears throat> I think being, being a pastor myself and just seeing the twisted theology and, and all these bizarre reasonings and lines of logic, I logic, I use that loosely that people come up with to defend God's grace. Um, you know, and there's this cheap grace. I think that part of that is, um, 
it's so much easier for people to sit on the sidelines. And I think that's why you had, mm -hmm. I mean, literally hundreds of millions of people cheering you on all over the world. Like, yes, yeah, so, you know, abuse is bad. Talking about Saeed being abused, of course, exactly. you know, right. by the Iranian government. Right. Abuse is bad. This is horrific. Mm -hmm. Persecution is bad. It's really easy for people to sit on the sidelines and say how horrific these things are until there has to be some kind of an investment from them. And that's mm -hmm. when you find the Job friend syndrome where people are usually good friends for a very short time. And then all of a sudden they, they sit in this awkward silence and they're like, all right, all right, uh, Nagme, for real, what did you do? Did you cheat on them? Did you, mm -hmm. you know, and they start coming up with all this stuff. Like, how did you make God mad? What did you do wrong? Right. And it's this twisted, mm -hmm. bizarre thing because investing in somebody who, who genuinely is broken or in danger, it requires a lot from us. It really does. Mm -hmm. And I feel like so many Christians aren't taught to be protectors. They're taught to take this passive approach. Like, let's just pray everything into God's hands and God will take care of it. Well, it doesn't work that way. It wasn't, it wasn't designed to work that way. God designed us to protect each other and to help each other and to help mete out justice and to defend and shield off wicked people. You know, Paul over and over talks about uh, really wicked people. And he says, they go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived have nothing to do with them, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, those who have spoken out about abuse, they've lost a great deal, a lot of friends, quote unquote friends. And mm -hmm. that's actually God's protection. That was God's protection over me because mm -hmm. I didn't realize if this hadn't come out and say people were waiting to make money off of our story. And when I became untouchable, it's like all the wolves disappear. Right. It's like, yeah, it was good. I didn't realize it at that time. God was like, okay, I'm going to put a wolf spray on you and <laughs> you come out. These wolves, they're, they love surrounding you and taking photos with you mm -hmm. um, because they're benefiting and they're waiting for sight to come out. So you can, you know, uh, they can associate, say this organization helped me and this organization, and right. they can yep. benefit more. But uh, when the abuse came out, they didn't want to touch it. And God's just like, I'm protecting you from these people. And so mm -hmm. those friends that go silent, uh, those big names, those, you know, right now I'm, I'm addressing an issue within my own church organizations. It's, it's the good old boys club. They're all friends. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get invited to speak at any of the churches. You're going to, mm -hmm. you know, get shunned, but it doesn't, I have lost every, it doesn't mean anything to me. I, you know, I, I have nothing to fear. Everyone shuns me. I have Jesus. I've already been there, done that 2015. And so all it matters to me is honoring God, but there's that fear. There's people that start stepping away from you because, oh, if I associate with her, then I might lose that opportunity, you know, at that church or at that opportunity to speak or you know this name big name is going to be mad at me and so their loyalty to people and money and fame and praises of men is more than their loyalty to god and god will yeah. test all of us in that area where are you willing to lose everything for his sake mm -hmm. because the number one commandment um, is to love god with all your heart yeah. mind yeah. strength you know everything he wants everything. And if that's not there, that you can't love people um, properly, there's going to be strings attached. There's going to be manipulation. But if God is first, you're willing to lay down your life for the one sheep. You're willing to speak out for the yeah. one abused person and not be associated, not have big names associate you with them. Yeah. And in order to love people properly, you need to put them first. And it releases you from bondage, you know, releases you from um, idols that you're bowing down to that are, um, taking you to a road of darkness. I, I love yeah. the part of your life story where as a child, I believe you said it by age nine, someone gave you a Bible. I was given my first Bible by my grandmother at that age. And I, like you devoured my Bible. Um, I just, it, it became so real to me. God and Jesus became so real, but unlike you, you were persecuted in your own home by your parents, <coughs> excuse me, thinking they were doing right, you know, trying to bring you back, um, as you said, de-educate you, you know, from the Bible, but 
I'm wondering if you're thirsting after Jesus and after God um, was instilled as that young child and you never lost that thirst for God. And I see it in you. I see that passion, um, that desire for that relationship. And so many people lose that along the way um, when they're struggling, you know, but instead your thirsting after him became more, it, it became the, the only thing you thought about. And that's what, you know, has saved you. But I yeah, love it, that. Yes, it did. Um, it did my relationship with God. There was a coldness distant when I was under the abuse. And that's what sure. I think people should realize if they don't know if they're under abuse or not, are you thriving the way God wants mm -hmm. his children to thrive to bear fruit? There should be joy and peace in your life. If there's, yes. if you are, you feel like you're wasting away. I, I, I felt like I was wasting away mm -hmm. and I didn't know why. And the pastor that told me you're, you're an abused wife is like going to a doctor and saying, I'm caught, you know, I'm coughing. There is this, I have a back pain and thinking, oh, it's just like a cold or something. And the doctor saying, you have cancer. This is chemo yeah. stuff. This is not like yeah. eat a Tylenol. Yeah. And that's what it, that's what shook me. I thought, you know, maybe it's just, maybe it's just a marriage issue, but I knew I was wasting away. I knew I was moving towards death and my spirit, I was just the shell Mm -hmm. So, you know, when something's wrong, you should not be wasting away in a relationship that's godly. You right. should be thriving. Your relationship with God should be getting closer. You should be experiencing God's love and goodness more if that relationship is from God. And it wasn't my, there was a distance, you know, as a child, I had that mm -hmm. fire and I, there was a price I paid for following Jesus coming out right. of a Muslim family. And I, I knew that from the moment I got saved, there was persecution until I, and then I went to Iran, I was arrested for my faith and, you know, threatened right. to be killed and raped. And I, you know, God helped me stand for my faith. But mm -hmm. in that time of abuse, there was a coldness had entered in my relationship with God because scripture was used to destroy me. And I thought, is yes. this who you are God, you know, right. right. But I have to say, uh, I think every step in my life, God prepared me for the next mm -hmm. standing up to a very, um, evil government, a bully, Iran, you know, I was always threatened to be quiet and uh, I was getting phone calls, threatened, you know, uh, it really prepared me to being bullied by the church. Yeah. <laughs> you yes. know, it's like yeah. being bullied yeah. by big names, you know, it's like, I had to decide, okay, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to advocate for not just Said for the persecuted church. I'm going to, there was a time I chased down the Iranian government in a hotel in New York you know, I was every, every time they were at a United nation meeting, I was there, I was in their face. I was mm -hmm. calling them out. I was on the news. And so the same persistence, despite all the threats, because my goal was to get Saeed out. My goal was to call out Iran on their uh, persecution of Christians. Right. The same thing was required when I, the abuse stuff came out because the bullies changed from the outside world to the inside, mm -hmm. but yeah. God has prepared me to say, okay, the bullies, there, it's not the Iranian government anymore. It's mm -hmm. the yeah. inside. And I've prepared you for this to stand up and take it. Yeah. And, you know, I really felt like you said, I had millions of attack. I felt like I was just being stoned to death. I was just mm -hmm. stoned. And it, um, God was cleansing me of people's opinion, not caring. But, you know, I really felt like I was bleeding by the side of the road, by the end of all the accusations and all the, a hero and an idol was a question. Mm -hmm. And like you said, and I was attacked for, for, uh, you know, I was told when, uh, I wrote that email and then it got in the media that I was an abused wife. I was told by very well-known people, just say you had a mental breakdown, you're mentally ill, say you're on depression and anxiety pills. And what you said was not. Yeah. 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 This is, Deja vu. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was told to say I'm mentally ill. Yep. Or I'm on medication. And what mm -hmm. I they wanted to, they wanted to cover it up. And I said, right. I can't say that. No. I'm not gonna, I said, I'm not gonna say anything more about Saeed. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not gonna go out there and continue saying I was abused, but I'm not gonna say I'm mentally ill. Right. I knew I'm finally seeing what I've been under. Mm -hmm. And I was pressured by people to really big names to say I was mentally ill. To lie. Said, you mm -hmm. were pressured to lie. Yeah. Yes. How sad. How sad is that? Yeah. 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 It's awful. Yeah. Yeah. I call I call this the um the cardboard uh testimony syndrome where, you know, we have 
what you used to be. And then you flip it around and on the other side, like God magically waved the wand and this is who I am now in Christ. And I'm like, we literally parade people across the stage, showing them that. And I'm like, with abuse survivors, what do they, what do you put on your card? You know, yeah. what, what do you write on your card? It doesn't fit that narrative that God instantly changes people's lives and transforms them. And, and so, you know, you guys are kind of this, um, stick in the spokes of, of the church because you tell truth and you say, yeah. you know, what happened to me was not right. It doesn't feel right. It's not right. Jesus doesn't stand for abuse. And that really messes with people who are stuck in this Western idea of like God instantly saves, you know, the supersize me um, effect where we're addicted to everything big and greasy mm -hmm. and unhealthy. And that's permeated into the Christian world where we want, we want the, the fat, greasy hamburger and we want it now. Like that's how we want our faith to, to be portrayed as this tasty. And, and I think also we want everything. that happy ending. We want mm -hmm. that very happy. Hollywood. Hollywood has, is in our brain. Yeah. 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 Yes. And so, God, there's, there's not a lot of happy endings in the Bible. And in yeah, terms of no. I, I have my happy ending. I am thriving. I am not anxious anymore. I don't yes. have panic attacks. I have joy. Uh, I'm, you know, my children, that's God's happy ending for me yes. is yeah. that I am thriving as his yes. child. I am no longer in bondage, but that's not what the world says a happy ending no. should be. And it's sad that, um, like you said, there was, there was silence because people didn't like this ending. Mm -mm. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 Well, I want to talk about um, a, a current event that's, I mean, it's everywhere in the news right now um, in Afghanistan, because it, you know, this certainly is, I mean, the persecution is just unreal. And I think we, we can't even begin to fathom. And um, you have been a very strong voice for Muslim women. Um, you have, you have a ministry reaching out to them. Um, I think a lot of Christians are, they, they've, kind of turn this into a political, they, they want to bark about which president messed up worse. And, you know, in, in my mind, most presidents don't get it right completely. Um, and they're never going to read our, our, our angry tweets anyway. That'll never get into the president's presence. So we're kind of wasting breath. What do we do about um, what's going on right now? As Christians, uh, oppression is absolutely real persecution is absolutely real christians are literally dying uh women are being uh beaten and children women and children are being beaten threatened um dragged out into the streets like it is absolutely horrific what do we do how do we how do we actually minister to people instead of just barking on social media well my having come out of islam and having I, have, I was not a refugee I was an immigrant but I've always had a heart for um, refugees the foreigners I think that's the heart of God since for 20 some years I've uh, been you know I love Muslims I gen um, some of my family members are still Muslim mm -hmm. uh, I don't um, spend time with them or serve them to convert them I do share Jesus but the conversion is in God's hand I do want them to experience the same life that I have experienced because many of these women uh, that I've, God has allowed me to reach because of my own abuse, go through abuse, go through a religion or a culture that says it's okay for your husband to cheat on you, have multiple wives. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I was sharing with some Muslim woman, I said, but in your spirit, you, you're anxious, like something's off mm -hmm. for God mm -hmm. to say that your husband can do that. So we've talked about that because, I mean, one of my biggest anxieties was Saeed leaving late at night, going to clubs. And I was trying to ignore the fact that there was, you know, adultery happening in our marriage and stuff. But it's just so my experience has helped me to address um, to just be raw and real and transparent with Muslim women and say, this is not the heart of God, which what you said about the, cur the current status of the church is sad because we are not we're not uh, able to be effective for the gospel when we have this, uh, we will defend our idol and the structure to the point of uh, the weak and the needy or the oppressed wasting away. Because if we didn't have that mentality, so many would flock to churches. 
you know, here I'm telling, uh, here I'm telling Muslim women, I'm telling these people that that's not who God is. Mm -hmm. You know, God is not about covering up and God is not about you wasting away in a marriage or in an institution. And then our churches are saying, yes, he is. Don't you dare speak out. You know, one thing that we're ruining a good man's name. Yeah. Well, and that one of the, that's exactly what Islam says though. One mm-hmm. of the things Muslims are really surprised about is why does the Bible talk about David's sin? Why does the Bible say, mm-hmm. you know, Abraham lied? Like they are so shocked that the Bible just talks about these prophets sin openly mm-hmm. because in Islam, you don't do that. You cover up. And mm-hmm. so here I'm witnessing to Muslims saying, that's not my God. It's, my God is not a God of cover up. My God does not want people oppressed and but then the church is behaving that way. Where should they go? So we have become an, an effective and not a safe place um, for the lost. If we were to repent of the way we, uh, um, we've we been caught up in the world and idolatry, so many would come. So many would find the church a safe place and, and we would see so much salvation. We want to reach the lost, but we've become an, an effective because protecting the institution protecting the abuser has become so much more important than um, sitting down with the oppressed and making the church a safe place for them. So uh, my heart has always been uh, reaching the foreigners. You know, we can't go to Afghanistan right now. Uh, It's hard because not only Afghanistan, I've been sharing this for years. Turkey is becoming pretty radical. Mm -hmm. Basically, Christians in the Middle East have nowhere to go. And not just Christians, anyone. I mean, Muslims of a different belief than the current government. Anyone that does not believe in a certain radical Islamic way has no safe place to go in the Middle East. There's no safe country to run to. Turkey used to be that, but Turkey is becoming radical. I have so many refugee friends that are living in Turkey, not knowing if it's going to become Afghanistan, Hmm. if things are going to close close in on them. So it's unfortunate. there's people paying the price all over the world for their faith. And we're caught up in this idolatry. We're, we're just so caught up in the world why the rest of the church is paying such a heavy price. Yeah. And it's really sad. That breaks my heart. Um, but just, we can't do much with Afghanistan in terms of they're really stuck. I mean, um, but women are being killed if they're, you know, if the smallest hair is showing or if they're, you know, uh, women are persecuted the most, women and children, little girls are being taken as sex slaves, boys are being sexually molested, and the, the least of these uh, are being oppressed the most. Uh, but what we can do, and what I've been really focused on in the last 20 some years, is the refugees that are here, instead of being afraid of them, we can reach yeah. them with the love of God, they have relatives in Afghanistan, they have relatives in Somalia, I mean, I've, I've, I meet people from all over the world. I have Afghani friends, I have uh, Ethiopian friends, Somalian friends, Iraqi, Syrian. We can reach the world right here. And why are we not doing it? Because we're, we've become ineffective. Why are we as a church not reaching people here yeah. in America with the love of God? And that will, you know, when our family got saved, when I got saved here in America, and then about a decade later, my parents got saved, You know what happened? We started sharing with our relatives overseas in Iran. We had close to over 30 relatives got saved within a year in Iran. So people getting saved here affects other countries because they will be calling their family. They will be saying, let me pray for you. I found Jesus. Can I send you a Bible? And so we have opportunity here to make a difference across the world, but we're not. So we are not powerless. We, we, God has given us uh, God has asked us to be witness and we can't be witness if we're prideful and arrogant and we're not willing to sit with the foreigners and those who are, you know, um, mm-hmm. if we're fearful of them and, you know, and I just, my heart has been, there's been so many political climates around refugees and stuff, but for 25 mm-hmm. years, that's mm-hmm. all where I've been whether it's popular to do it or not popular. Mm -hmm. And God has, I've seen fruit. I've seen people get saved and, and more than anything, you know, for them to know, um, to, to have a good experience with a Christian. Yeah. I'm not here to convert you. I do want to tell you about the love of Jesus, but I love you regardless of you convert or not. And that's the heart of God, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is super powerful. And, uh, 
yeah, I hope one day we'll take our eyes off the well, social media, just um, a lot of people don't play nice. It, it brings the um, it brings a different side of people out. And I think part of that, it, it's just so easy to be a, a keyboard warrior in the name of Jesus, right? And tell everybody all the things that are wrong in the world. Instead of doing that, go out and talk to your neighbor, sit with them, cry with them. You know, like there, there's a lot of sorrow in this world. There's a lot of joy and absolutely, you know, we should focus on God's joy, but there's also a lot of sorrow. There's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of oppression. There are a lot of uh, women and children who are stuck in really, really dangerous homes uh, right here in the States. I mean, millions of them. So you don't yeah. have to take the time. We have a schedule. Uh, getting into other people's lives requires time. You kind of have to yeah. free up the schedule. When I go to these, when I hang out with my refugee friends, sometimes I'm there for five, six hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when they open up. That's when you hear about the abuse and you hear about their trials. And, and that's with everyone. That's with our neighbor. You know, uh, it's, it requires us messing up our own schedules of our pleasure, of our hobbies and saying, you know what, God, I hand over my time to you. I want to invest it for the kingdom. What does that look like? And being real with, instead of portraying, I mean, I, my life that um, that seemed to be the perfect Christian family life. Uh, I mean, God used that for a season, but uh, having that facade fall apart and just being real has actually given me more opportunity to share. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we've experienced that as well. Very much so. It's just yeah, being raw, being real, um, not being afraid to offend people. I used to be like you, I was still afraid, like always the polite kid, um, into adulthood, like never wanted to ruffle feathers. Hate. I still hate confrontation. And now like, if it's on my mind, I'm just going to say it because <laughs> I think, you know, like <laughs> after a while you just learn, like you, you, you get so tired of dealing with ugliness all the time that you're like, all right, like time's limited. Let's get to the point. Abuse sucks and you need to get out, <laughs> you know, I'm going to help you get out or whatever. And I think part of me not wanting confrontation was what really helped my abuser thrive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay, you know, That's I'll so just true. do whatever. I don't want, I don't want drama. And that mm -hmm. actually helps them to thrive. So there's a good balance of um, when to speak out right. and not avoid confrontation. And when to just, there are things I was thinking today, you know, a lot of people are messaging me and just basically need to be quiet. Why are you speaking about other people's sin? And there's a lot of things I'm quiet about. I don't, I, no one really knows where I stand with the vaccine or mask or whatever. Yep, there's a lot same. of things I, I'm like, you know what? It's opinion and it's conscience. And yep. I'm not going to cause division in the body of Christ by bringing up my own ideas. Mm -hmm. But so I am quiet on a lot of things, but mm -hmm. on this one, I cannot be silent. That is yes. not the heart of God to be silent on abuse. Right. So yes. I don't like confrontation and I'm quiet on a lot of issues that I don't believe should be dividing the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. But this issue, if it's dividing the body of Christ, it's dividing it in a good way. It should yeah. not be. This issue yeah. should not be dividing the body of Christ, of mm -hmm. standing up for the abused. This, yeah. You read the Bible from front to back. This one issue of standing up, keeping leaders accountable, uh, calling out leaders. And this one issue should be should unify the church yes. more than anything yes. the same way when i was advocating for saeed everyone was unified i had liberal christians conservative christians unified mm -hmm. this is not right what the iranian government's doing mm -hmm. it's so obvious it's wrong it unified the church i have i, I have a, you know a lot of friends that are in different sides of you know very liberal christians and mm -hmm. some are kind of questioning their faith now to very conservative you know and they all said there was if this issue of Saeed's imprisonment brought such unity. No one questioned that it was wrong for Saeed or Christian to be in prison for the faith. No one questions that it's wrong for Taliban to be abusing women and children the way they're doing right now. Yeah. That is not because speaking out against that should not be causing division. Right. 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 Anyone right. saying so speaking out about abuse should not be causing division. If there's yeah. division, then something's wrong something's very mm -hmm. wrong right. something's very wrong yeah. if there's division in the church of mm -hmm. of not speaking out for women and children sometimes men who are being abused right. and oppressed yeah. and silenced 
And right. so if we're not unified as a church, it's not because we should not be speaking out. It's because something's wrong. If someone speaks out about Afghanistan and there's disunity, it's not the person speaking out is not wrong. Mm -hmm. Why is there disunity about women and children being raped and killed? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so this one, this speaking out about abuse should be the one thing that actually unifies us as a church, not divides us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think in closing, um, tell us a little bit about your ministry, what you do. do you, you said you started your organization? Yeah, I started the organization in 2018. I had some women uh, who were being arrested and put in prison in Iran for their Christian faith. And so I called my friend, Miriam Ibrahim, who was sentenced to death in Sudan for her faith. Hmm. She lived in Virginia. And I said, what can we do for these women? And long story short, she had been invited to an event in Washington, D.C. Um, for Coptic Solidarity, their 10th year anniversary. And she was speaking with like other persecuted Christians. She said, come to D.C. Let's see if we can get some help there. Um, you know, and so um, really, I, we, I travel, we traveled to D.C. and we were told by multiple politicians that in order to help these persecuted women, you need to have an organization. Mm -hmm. So we start an organization. But what people don't know is what uh, the people that started the organization, me and Miriam, and there was a few others, what uh, was the underlying factor of how we even connected was we all had come out of domestic abuse. Hmm. And Miriam, yeah. who was on death row and tortured and gave birth in prison in Sudan um, to her daughter, Maya, uh, and was on death row for her faith, she said that the domestic abuse she was under was worse than what she suffered in Sudan. That was her first, she, she, that was one of her first calls to me. She said, not me, this is worse. I knew the enemy. I don't know the enemy here, it, it's confusing. And uh, I just, so it started out helping persecuted uh, Christians, but over time we decided let's talk about this. Uh, and I started not feeling so much shame to talk about the abuse and uh, but just over the last year, I've uh, taken a break from it. Part of me has always been resistant in having a ministry. It's kind of become, it has become a dirty word to me um, because it's just, so I'm just seeking God on that. I really, um, it can, it can muddy the waters to uh, a lot of people we work with are women who come out of domestic abuse or persecuted Christians. It kind of doesn't feel right to uh, spot, put a spotlight on them. Uh, when they're suffering and actually their suffering should be uh, kept a secret in order to raise money to be able to function as an organization. Yeah. And so there's just something that is not sitting well with me and I've kind of taken a break. I do want to serve, um, but I just, you know, ministry, I, and I want to say this, I was told, Saeed was told um, by very big names, if people, uh, and I was told that if people know that Saeed was abusive, had he had cheated on you, which he confessed uh, to some of these big names, uh, then he will never have a ministry. And I was told, you can have a ministry. Just be quiet. You can have a ministry. And I thought, mm -hmm. why do we even want a ministry? Like, you're telling me to, to be quiet. And you're saying to Saeed, don't to being abusive and have cheated on your wife. So you could have a ministry that's idolatry. Yeah. You know, you should be telling this guy, get on your face, repent, make it right with God. And then your family. Right. Um, and, and it, but instead saving a ministry became so important. And so it's just, I, I kind of struggle with, um, necessarily having a ministry. It's just, um, it, because I've seen the idolatry of it. So we um, have a very, very similar philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> we should talk sometime because <laughs> I, you know, I went down that path, the nonprofit organization. I hated every minute of it. I hated mm -hmm. asking people uh -oh. for money. Same thing, uh -oh. like highlighting stories that have to do with abuse to show the, the wins, the successes. And I'm like, I can't, that's, do not, that. that's not me. Yeah. That's not no, me. I just. I've tried, I've tried to convince myself it's for the benefit of the people, but I just can't, I can't highlight someone, someone's pain. And especially since they need to be protected, um, mm -hmm. both the abused and the persecuted mm -hmm. church, they can't really be highlighted. It's not good for them. Right. And I just, it's, it doesn't sit right with me. So, um, but it, it was good for a season. It was good to experience that for a season, but it's on pause right now. And yeah, yeah. well, 
maybe you shouldn't talk to me because I'll, I'll just talk you out of going to, going back to it. <laughs> <laughs> Not feeling led to go back. Right? I know. I, so I, yeah, I just did my, like I have Jimmy Hinton LLC. So it's just a, like the protective part of it in name only. So I just, I'm like, you know what? Like I blog, we do the podcast, um, wrote a book. Like, I'm just, I'm going to, I would, I'm doing the same thing now that I did before any organization was even a thought. Mm-hmm. And it's, that's just who I am. It's what I do. And I know because you know, I can speak out, I can talk. Sure, right. I don't need to be raising money for that. So, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. well, what parting message would you give to people who are in uh, abusive marriages, domestic abuse, sexual abuse, um, spiritual abuse, whatever it is? What's, what's the message that you want to give them? I think as uh, Christians, I don't know about the non-Christian world, but you know something's off. And I think even with non-Christians, I, I've, I've talked to Muslim women where they know something's not off if their husband's looking for a second wife. Like, um, the, the Holy Spirit really uh, stirs within you you have there's ang- 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 a lot of times you confuse anxiety with uh god telling you there's something wrong here you're not at ease you're just you're wasting away so just uh you know we we talk about listening to the holy spirit being in, led by this holy spirit not being grieved by the holy spirit and slowly i'm learning what that means it's really listening to god and when he's telling you we all get this sense of from people discernment or situations and if you are in a relationship where something is off and I couldn't put the word abuse on it when I was going through it but I knew something was off I was wasting away in my thought I always wanted to I always thought to myself I just want to die I would repeat that multiple times throughout the day I just want to die I just want to die there was no desire to live Mm -hmm. and if that's happening to you look up abuse because you will see most likely if you're not, you have not been physically beaten, you're probably under some kind of abuse Mm -hmm. as a, as a child of God, you should not be in any relationship, whether friendship, romantic relationship, marriage, father, child, or parent relationship that none of those relationships should be bringing you to a place of despair and wasting away. They should, if it's, if they're godly people, they should be bringing you to a place of thriving before God growing in your relationship with God and um, growing in, in, you know, in a place of peace and joy, discovering that in your relationship with God. Awesome. Yes. Very powerful. Well, Nagme, your, your story is very powerful. Um, your faith is awesome. Your courage yes. is incredible. And uh, we are incredibly awesome. honored. Yeah. We're honored to have you on the show. Um, it is a joy to sit at your feet. It truly is. Thank you so very much for sharing no, it's, with us. It's, it really, you know, it's really God that has brought all of us here and yes. has given us a voice. So, and God like shows you. in your life. And that's a beautiful God. thing. Thank, thank you. you. For sure. And uh, to our listeners, we thank you for tuning into the second episode and we'll catch you next round. Thanks again for listening to today's episode. Thank you to our patrons who make the podcast possible. If you found it helpful, please follow on Spreaker and search for the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast in your favorite podcast app. Be sure to hit subscribe and rate the show. If you believe in what we do, consider supporting the podcast by becoming a patron and check out the cool rewards our patrons receive. Share with your friends and tell the world. Join us in speaking out on sex abuse so we can change the tides and prevent abuse.